I'm glad to be here. It's my first time in Sweden. Um, I'm Rachel Andrew. I do a bunch of stuff on the web. Um, I've been kind of doing web development since about 1996, which makes me older than CSS. Um, and, and I've been actually doing web development since before CSS was really a thing. And I do a bunch of things. Um, I've got a couple of products, Perch and Noticed. So I do actually use CSS. I, I work with CSS as a front-end developer. I'm the editor-in-chief of Smashing Magazine. And really most relevant to this talk is that I'm a CSS working group invited expert. And I'm co-editor of a couple of specs, multi-column layout and page floats. You can find me on Twitter at Rachel Andrew, and my website is rachelandrew.co.uk. Um, and you'll find all sorts of things that I've written about CSS around the web. So I'm doing a couple of talks here. Um, tomorrow, I'm going to talk a bit more about layout specifications. Uh, I'm probably most known for my work on layout, things like CSS grid layout. But today, I'm going to give a bit of a quick overview of some of the things that are coming into CSS that I just find interesting and I think are going to be interesting for people to know about and know that they exist. But I'm also going to talk a bit about the process that gets us new CSS into browsers. Because you may have noticed that over the last few years, new things seem to be getting into browsers an awful lot more quickly than they used to. And so I'm going to talk a bit about that process and how that's actually happening and how we're kind of speeding things up. You will find all of my slides and the code and the resources at this URL. Um, I'm showing a bunch of little demos and things. You'll be able to find all of those online and play around with them. And I'll show that again at the end, and I've, I've put it on Twitter as well. So before we start looking at some of this new stuff, let's think about how we actually get new CSS, the process that gets us new CSS, the process that I'm involved in with the CSS working group. So any new CSS feature is ultimately going to be discussed and specified by the CSS working group. And there's a whole bunch of us who are on that group. Uh, most of the people on the CSS working group are essentially representatives from browser vendors. So you've got people from all of the main browsers. You've also got representatives of other people who use CSS. If you're a web developer, you might not be aware that a big use of CSS is in the sort of publishing world. So you have people from EPUB and also who use CSS for print. There are a bunch of user agents that output CSS for actually doing print and, and PDFs and things. So some of those people are also on the working group. And I deal with them in my work with multi-column page floats because those specs are used a lot by people who are doing print things. And then there's a few independent people, and I'm one of them. And typically, we're invited experts, because everybody else on the working group is kind of part of a member organization, You know, for instance, in Microsoft or Google or, or whatever. Um, and they send their represent representatives. There's a few others of us who just do stuff with CSS and have some thoughts about it. And so we're brought on as well as invited experts. So that's how we get involved. Now, all of the work of the working group is done in a public way. Everything we do ends up somewhere that you can go and have a look at. The majority of that now um, is on GitHub. It used to all be in a mailing list called www.style, which if you signed up to, you'd get this absolute torrent of information every day, and it was impossible to work through. Uh, these days, everything is on GitHub. So any issue on a CSS spec is raised on GitHub. You can go and have a look at them. We have face-to-face -face meetings, and we have weekly teleconferences. Those things are logged in IRC. And if we discuss any of the issues on GitHub, that gets logged against the issue. So people can follow along with issues they care about and not have to read absolutely everything that the CSS Working Group outputs, because there's an awful lot of it. So if you want to follow any feature, a good way to do that is to have a look, find it on GitHub, and you can follow that just like you could a feature request for any open source project. And when we start to talk about shiny new CSS, there's a few things it's kind of worth understanding, because it just makes it clearer when we're talking about these things. So one of those things are the sort of levels of CSS. You know, you sometimes hear people talk about CSS1, CSS2, CSS3. Sometimes people ask maybe where CSS4 is. Now, CSS3 was essentially what happened when we had, we had CSS1 and 2, and they were just like one specification. 
Um, you know, I, one of the books I wrote early on, um, I basically went through the entire CSS spec and, and wrote about all of it. I couldn't do that today because there's far too much CSS. Um, so CSS1 and CSS2 were just a single monolithic document documenting all of CSS. And by the time the working group wanted to do CSS3, they were like, hang on, there's an awful lot of CSS here. And to put it all in one document meant the document had to, couldn't really progress and be classed as finished. So CSS got broken down into modules. And so when people talk about CSS3, what they're really talking about are those first modules. What was CSS2 broken down into a set of modules, and that kind of became what we described as CSS3. So we have something like selectors. Selectors has been around for a very long time. Um, we ended up with selectors level three, and that had the things that were in CSS2 and some extra things that were added at that point. Um, so that's level three of the spec. But we now also have CSS selectors level four, which has some new things in it, uh, which have been added since then. And so that's a new, a new version of the specification, almost like a feature release, as it were. But there isn't a CSS4. Because we also have modules, and we're going to see some of them today, that are at level one. They never existed in CSS 1 and 2. So something like grid layout, for example, uh, started life as a level one spec. Now, it's not CSS 1, obviously. That's something from way in the past. Um, so we've got all these different things moving at different, different times through the specification process. Uh, this is an article that I wrote just explaining why we don't have a CSS 4, why that isn't a thing that exists. And the other thing that's kind of worth understanding are the phases that these specifications go through to become what we call a DOE3C recommendation, which is kind of what you might want to think of as a web standard. It's sort of a finished spec. We're saying, this is it. This is what you should implement. If you want to implement this bit of CSS, this is the specification that you're implementing against. If you want to use this bit of CSS, you should be able to trust what's in this spec as to what browsers will render. So that's kind of a recommendation. And the documents themselves move through a process, a sort of iterative process, as they get to that point. And they start their lives as a working draft. So that's just a spec that's been worked on. Things can be in working draft status for a very, very long time. Um, but that's, you know, as we're working on it, it's a working draft. So this is um, multiple column layout, and it's a working draft. Multicol is actually interesting because it did go to the next phase at one point, um, and then it kind of got abandoned. It was abandoned in about 2013. Um, I took the spec on last year, and so I took it back to working draft because there was lots of stuff that needed fixing. Um, so specs can move in and out of different phases. It's not just a sort of linear process always. Um, if you look at any spec, though, you can see all the previous versions listed. They're all dated. When we publish a new working draft, it gets a date which means you can go back and you can figure out where something got removed from a spec or got added to a spec, which can be quite useful, particularly if you're looking at some, something older and sort of like, you know, why has that disappeared or what have you. So you can hop back through those. Now, you can also go to the editor's draft. Now, the editor's draft is the actual document that a spec editor, like myself, is working on at the time. So if I push a commit to GitHub, it will end up in the editor's draft. So if I push a mistake to GitHub, it ends up in the editor's draft. So the editor's drafts are pretty nice to look at to see exactly what has gone into the spec very recently. Um, but it could change. It could have mistakes in there. Um, and it's not dated. You know, that could change day to day. Uh, what we do is when we sort of got a good collection of work, we go back to the working group, ask permission to publish a new working draft, and then that gets published with a date, and we don't change those. So if you're, say, writing about a specification, you can be sure that the stuff in a dated working draft isn't going to suddenly change. We might publish a new one, but that one will stay there. But it's always, if, you, if you're look, looking at really new stuff, looking in the editor's draft will get you exactly what we've just discussed. So once a spec's deemed kind of complete, it moves to be a candidate recommendation. 
And at that point, we're saying we would like implementation experience. We want the browser vendors or anyone else who uses CSS to actually start implementing. Now, in reality, that often happens a lot earlier. I say it's an iterative process. We write specifications, browsers sort of build on them. Sometimes the specification comes from the browser vendor um, and then comes into the working group. So it's, it's a bit of a circular process. But at, at CR status, we're hoping that people are going to start implementing and shipping their, that feature in the browser. And to get out of CR status, so to end up to become a, a W3C recommendation, we need to have two independent implementations of every feature in the spec. And what this stops is one browser coming up with a new feature, implementing it in their browser, and then saying, here is a new W3C recommendation. And that feature, for whatever reason, can't be implemented in other browsers. You know, perhaps just technically it doesn't work. Because uh, what we want is things to work in all the browsers in the same way. So we have to have two different implementations of every feature before something can be declared a recommendation. And that's kind of a bit of protection there um, to make sure things work well for everyone. So that's a bit about how we work on these things. Um, and as I talk about different specs and mention the level they're at or, or the sort of status they're in, it just gives you a bit of an understanding of what I'm actually talking about. And so I'm going to start with uh, layout because that is my favorite thing. As I say, I'm not going to go too much into layout because I've got a whole talk tomorrow to, to talk about layout. Um, so grid level one is currently at candidate recommendation status. And so it's a really good example of a spec that has a CR at level one and actually also has a level two in progress at the same time. So CSS grid layout, the level one spec was shipped in all major browsers really in, in 2017. In fact, most of the browsers within a few weeks of each other. So we've got this level one spec at candidate recommendation, and pretty much everything in there is implemented. Um, it's a very solid implementation in all the browsers that have implemented it. Uh, it's really very bug free considering how sort of new it is as far as people being able to use it because grid was something which was developed behind a browser flag so it's kind of it was in development in browsers for about five years before it landed and we all got to actually use it so you can pretty much be happy to use grid um, in supporting browsers it's not full of bugs but while we've got level one at cr status we've also got grid level two uh, which is um, currently a working draft um, the original level one draft had for a good part of the history, and if you went back through the, um, the history of that draft, you'd find there's a feature called subgrid in there. And that feature got bumped out of level one because no one had implemented it. And because of this issue of needing to have two separate implementations of every feature, what you don't want is a feature sat in the spec that people are saying, this isn't ready yet, we can't implement it, because uh, it'll just hold up the whole spec. And so we bumped this subgrid feature into level two so we could kind of figure out how it was going to work. Um, and it meant it didn't sort of hold back the progress of the initial spec. So subgrid, the, the whole idea of subgrid is that if you've worked with grid layout at all, you'll know that only the direct children of the grid container can be on the grid. So you can declare a grid, you can sit your items on it as long as they're direct children in the source. Uh, same as with Flexbox, so you've got to have direct children for them to become flex items. Uh, sub subgrid will let us kind of cascade the grid down through the, through the element, so you could have something which is nested down inside your HTML, but still goes on an overall grid, which of course is going to be very useful. I will talk a bit more about grid layout tomorrow if you're in my talk then. If you're not going to be in my talk or you want some background reading, I wrote up kind of how the spec's going to work. We don't currently have a browser implementation of subgrid. Um, Firefox, I believe, are working on it at the moment. Um, so I kind of explained um, how it should work once we actually do get some browser implementations. I imagine we will start seeing those implementations relatively soon, because there's a lot of interest in having subgrid. So you can always have a look at that article. I'll come along tomorrow. Um, could you hold questions to the end? It would be easier. Thank you. Um, so um, CSS box alignment. Um, something else we're seeing happening more and more um, is bits of CSS that originally get into one spec 
and then get moved out and used in other things. Um, and this is great for the web because it means that as we're developing things, you know, if we have alignment in one spec, things are going to work in the same kind of way in another spec, which is useful. We don't have to learn a whole new alignment method for grid once we're used to using it in Flexbox, for example. And so the, the alignment properties that are in box alignment, most of those start their life in Flexbox. And I think it was the alignment properties in Flexbox that got most of us most excited about Flexbox to start with because we could suddenly do some of those things that had been utterly baffling. You know, why can't we do things like properly center an item? Um, and these things came in with Flexbox. So you know, say display flex, and align item center, and justify content center, and your box sits in the middle of the container, um, something that had seemed out of reach. We could do things like full height columns. In fact, the initial uh, value for line items is stretch, so you get full height columns by default if you use Flexbox. Now, those things are obviously incredibly useful, and so they were pulled out of the Flexbox spec. Uh, I think there's currently a, there's a note in the level one Flexbox spec saying, look at box alignment for the future, because all the new things will end up in there. And so they're in the box alignment spec. Now, box alignment deals with all things to do with alignment and also space distribution, because an awful lot of alignment on the web is actually sort of deciding what to do with leftover space. And so that meant we could then use them in grid layout. So we get this kind of common layout system building up, which works in the same way, no matter which layout method you're using. But in terms of new CSS, I wanted to talk about something else that is now part of the box alignment spec. So we have these gap features. Now, CSS Grid Layout uh, implemented these gap features, um, gap, row gap, and column gap. We also, in multicol, we also have a column gap feature, which is really the sort of the first thing that allowed us to do this kind of spacing out of columns. Now, they started in the grid layout spec, um, these gap features, but they've now been put into box alignment, because actually gaps between things fit quite nicely with other space distribution type properties. So initially in grid layout, we had grid column gap, grid row gap, and grid gap as a shorthand, which basically gives you these gutters or alleys or whatever between the tracks and, and not on the outside. They were then moved into box alignment and so renamed to column gap, row gap, and gap. I think most browsers have now implemented the renamed properties, uh, but we're kind of keeping the old grid prefixed ones hanging around probably forevermore um, because things, people had already built sites by that point, so they'll be kept as aliases. But now they've been renamed, so we've got column gap, row gap, and gap as a shorthand. They then make sense if you're in flex layout which means that you would be able to do gaps between flex items um, rather than having to put a margin on either side and then doing a negative margin to pull the things out, which once you've used grid layout seems utterly baffling in Flexbox that we're having to do this weird thing with margins to get gaps. Um, so we're going to have gaps in flex layout. It's in the spec. And it works in Firefox at the moment. They've shipped their implementation. I think they're the only one to have currently shipped the implementation. Um, this is the charts from MDN showing how we've got um, support in flex layout. Isn't great yet because it's pretty new and no one's really implemented it. But then we have support in grid layout, which is, is good other than um, obviously Internet Explorer, which doesn't have the gaps. Uh, they've got their older implementation of grid, which didn't have any kind of gutter properties. But hopefully we'll not have to wait too long for support in other browsers. Um, Firefox did theirs fairly quickly, which was great. So this is another concept which is part of grid layout, um, but it's becoming increasingly important across the layout stuff on the web. Um, this sort of idea of intrinsic sizing, of being able to size things based on the content of that item, as opposed to kind of explicitly setting an extrinsic width, saying, you know, I want you to be this big. You can say, well, how big is my content? Can you be that big? Can you be big enough for the content? So these intrinsic sizing keywords have been implemented in grid layout for track sizing. So we can kind of play around with them there. And they work anywhere that grid layout is implemented. 
So if I have three tracks at min content size, so I'm basically I'm using repeat three min content. I've got three tracks min content. So our grid ends up looking like this. So if I say min content, what happens is the track will get as small as it possibly can. If all of your tracks are just full of words, the track will essentially become as wide um, as the longest word. Uh, all the soft wrapping opportunities will be taken to collapse the, the sort of content of the tracks down to that width. So that's then no overflow is going to happen. It's not going to get smaller than the content, but it'll get as small as it can. Obviously, if you've got something in there which has a set width, that's going to cause the width. So if you put an image in there and said this image is 500 pixels, well, that's how big the track's going to be. Um, if you've got text in there, it'll just collapse down. So that's min content. And we have the opposite. We have max content. So if you say you want something at max content, it's going to do the opposite. It's going to get as big as it possibly can, and it won't do any wrapping. Now, obviously, if things don't wrap at all, oh, it probably is going to happen. It's going to break out of the box. So the border there is the size of the grid, and we've now got tracks that are actually too big um, to fit into the grid, which is why, by default, we don't max content size things on the web. Uh, but if you want to actually know how big something is, max content will give you that. In grid layout, we've got a keyword fit content that allows you to pass in a value. And this is incredibly useful because it gives you that kind of max content um, capability until you get to a certain size, and then you start wrapping. So whatever you've passed in, and in this case, I've passed in 10M. So it can be at max content until it gets to 10M and then starts doing the wrapping behavior. So you get something like this. So the first track has got to 10M and started wrapping. The second track never gets to 10M, so it just goes to max content. And the third track does the wrapping at 10M. So you can use those in grid. If you can use grid layout, you can use those sizing keywords. Uh, they're implemented everywhere. Um, where they're quite useful, I use them for things that have very flexible components. Um, so say I've got a component that has um, maybe a little icon in sometimes, but maybe a bigger image that I'd like to sort of resize down, because I've said it's max width to 100%. Um, you know, I can say um, fit content and the biggest size I ever want that to get. And then what happens is if it's a small image, it shrinks down. Um, but if it's a bigger image, it will stop at that fit content size I've passed in. So they're kind of nice ways to play around making more flexible components rather than having to make lots of components and put a class on them to say, oh, this is the one where my image is this big, and this is another one for where my image is so big. But what we are going to be able to do is then use them everywhere else on the web. Uh, Chrome has implemented um, min and max content, which you can use instead of a length when you're, say, setting a width or anything else. So you can say just width min content or width max content. So allowing you to actually size any element, doesn't have to be in a grid, based on those sizing keywords. So you'll end up with something like that. You could have a, something sized with min content or max content. We're going to be seeing this kind of thing a lot more. Um, our new layout methods are much better at dealing with kind of distributing space and so on. And so we can start looking at the content rather than just sort of setting everything to be a certain size and then squishing content into it. So away from layouts, I say I'm going to have a lot more layouts of tomorrow if that's something you're particularly interested in. I want us to look at some of the other things that have, have been implemented recently. And something we are doing quite a lot is looking at what people are doing with JavaScript and saying, well, can we do this in CSS in a more performant way? Um, because typically, if you're doing things you know, directly in CSS, it's going to perform better than something which is implemented on top in, in JavaScript. So one of those things is scroll snapping. Uh, this is this idea where when you're sort of scrolling through something, and particularly if you, you know, working with an app, um, and you drag, and it kind of snaps to the sort of best point. So you, you don't kind of have to keep on sliding it and, and lining it up. You can actually say, well, I would like this to snap to a certain point. Um, and that's what scroll snapping lets us do. Uh, now, this has been recently implemented in Chrome. There is an older version of the spec implemented in some other browsers. Firefox, for example, still implements a kind of early version, like a kind of prototype version of the spec. Um, Chrome has the, the, the newer version implemented. 
So this is kind of what it looks like. Um, so here I'm making the body the scroll container. Um, so I'm saying I want scroll snap type X. I want to be on the X axis and make it mandatory. So it kind of has to snap there. And then on the, the child item, I'm setting my scroll snap align to start. So this hopefully will let me sort of snap something on the x-axis as I'm scrolling and will go to the start of my images. So we've got something like this, and hopefully the little video will play. Um, so we, as we sort of drag it, you see it kind of bounces back if I don't get all the way across. Then if I get across, it kind of bounces onto the next one. Um, not an ideal thing to show on, on a video, but you can play around with, with the demo online. You can also do th little boxes. It doesn't have to be the whole page that you're scroll snapping. You might be, have some element which has a, a scroll bar, and you can use scroll snapping in that. So here I've got a list, and this time I'm going to do the y-axis, um, and I'm just going to snap to the top of my list items. So we've got a little box here. Um, as we sort of drag it, it snaps to the next, the next item, or bounces back up if I don't drag very far. So it's quite a nice little spec um, for doing that kind of thing. And if you're building things that are sort of slightly more app-like experiences on the web, I think these things are nice little enhancements. Um, you obviously need to be a little bit careful. You don't end up um, making something always bounce away so people can, can't scroll to the bottom of the box and so on. Um, and there's different types of scroll snapping in the spec that you can play around with. Um, again, you know, all this stuff does need careful testing. I find that as, as we're getting so much new stuff, uh, it just all raises new kind of accessibility problems and new things that we actually do have to remember to test. Now, in i5.5, you could color your scroll bars. And if you're as old as me, you can remember what the web looked like. Um, we're bringing it back as a standard. I'm not quite sure why, but we are. Um, so we're now in 2018, we're standardizing colored scroll bars. Um, with the CSS scroll bars spec, and Firefox have been implementing it. So you have scroll bar color, and that basically lets you um, color the thumbs, the bit that sort of slides up and down, and also the track. And in the next slide, you can see why I don't do any design. Um, but you know, so you can color your scroll bars. That's um, in Firefox Nightly. I think you still need to enable the flags to, to see it, but yes, we're, we're getting these colored scroll bars. Essentially, this is a standardization of something that browsers were already doing, and that's something you do see. It's kind of like, well, people do this thing. Um, let's do it in a standard way rather than have everyone implement their own weird way of doing it. We've also got scroll bar width, which is quite useful. If you've got small components, you can ask the browser, the user agent, to use its thin um, scroll bar. And you see, what we're not doing here is saying something absolute. We're basically saying, you know, if this user agent has a thin version of their scroll bar, I think I would like to use it. It's a bit more of a suggestion than a, a sort of absolute, I want it to be so big. Um, so obviously there's a default scroll bar, there's a thin scroll bar. You can also use scroll bar um, with none, which will not show a scroll bar at all, but will make the item still scrollable. Um, you obviously need to be careful with that because people need to know that they can still scroll. But if you are implementing some kind of other scrolling or you're designing something which is very much for um, a tablet, and it's going to be obvious that you're going to be able to scroll it, then you could always turn off the scroll bars. Um, but obviously, again, that's something to be quite careful of, because you could end up with things people just don't realize they can scroll down. So here's a, a thin scroll bar um, in Nightly. And that will, as I say, be very da much down to the user agent exactly what that looks like. Um, but it allows you to choose the thin one if that suits what you're doing. I wanted to talk a little bit about shapes. Uh, CSS shapes isn't particularly a new thing. It's been around for quite a long time. And uh, this is a spec that came from Adobe. Uh, you know, not all specs come from browser vendors. CSS shapes came from Adobe. And it allows you to curve text around things that aren't square boxes, which is unusual on the web. Um, and the reason I'm bringing it up is it's recently just been shipped in Firefox. So we've actually got very good browser support for CSS shapes. I think it's only Edge now that doesn't have support. What I wanted to show, though, is something that I think a lot of people don't realize you can do with shapes, and that's you can use a gradient as the shape. 
And the alpha channel support and shapes to sort of do some interesting things. So what I've got here is a linear gradient. And then I'm using shape image threshold to set the threshold that I want that shape to be used on. Um, so I've basically got the same linear gradient set as a background and used as the value of shape outside, just like I could use an image. Which you can see gives me this. So the text is now going along the line of that gradient. Um, but the interesting thing about using gradients like that is that we obviously don't necessarily want to do something that looks like it came from the 1990s. But you can use your gradient um, to create a shape but not actually show the gradient at all. So here I'm just using that gradient kind of as a mask um, as the value of shape outside. And that gives me my angled text. So that's kind of useful. Uh, you can do the same thing with an image. You can create an image uh, with a transparent area to use as the value um, of shape outside. Never show the image on the page, but use the, the shape of the image, the transparent part, as a mask to create your CSS shapes. That's a much easier way to create shapes than the other way, which is to use the sort of basic shape types and create a polygon and sort of poke it all around to try and get the shape you want. It's much easier just to use an image. So that's CSS shapes. If you've not played around with the shape spec, it's now got really good browser support. Um, really nice to use an enhancement, because obviously, if your design calls for angled text um, and the browser does not support shapes, that user doesn't get angled text. But they can still read the content. It's all fine. So shapes is something that's a really nice way to um, it sort of enhance your layouts. Really, the only thing you'd have to watch out for with that is if you were angling the text to avoid uh, an untidy background image, for example. And uh, you might want to do something to give older browsers a, a view that pushed the content away from the image or didn't show the image or something. Uh, but yeah, shapes is a nice one to use as an enhancement. And while talking about gradients, um, conic gradients. So it's something that Leah Veru has spoke about for a, a long time. Uh, she's been very keen to see conic gradients um, get into CSS. And they are now specified um, as part of images level four. And so we can, we've got an implementation in Chrome, so we can start to play around with those. Now, the conic gradient um, is really nice. We can, we can create something that looks like a cone, which is a sort of default use of a conic gradient. And I'm creating here um, a green and orange cone. And you get something that looks like that. But you can also do things like create a pie chart out of conic gradients uh, by adding hard stops for the colors. So rather than sort of having it gradienting, just sort of stopping chunks of the color as you go around the circle, um, you can end up with a pie chart using just one line of CSS. And that's, that gives you that. You can also create Pac-Man, which I created Pac-Man by mistake while trying to create a pie chart. And I thought, well, that's Pac-Man, so there we go, um, <laughs> if you like. Um, as I say, it's just in Chrome at the moment. Uh, Leah, who's been talking about this for a long time, um, has a CSS conic gradient polyfill, if you sort of really need them. Um, of course, the other thing you could do is you could create, if you were, say, using conic gradients for charts, you could create your pie chart with a conic gradient, and you could load in an image for non-supporting browsers, um, or what have you, or present the data in a different way. Um, but anyway, that's just a nice little addition um, to the level four images spec, another way of doing gradients. Now, while we're here, I want to talk a little bit about some of the things that Firefox have been doing. Because if you're using some of these new CSS features, uh, Firefox DevTools have a whole bunch of really great tools for designing for the web. And I think this is really interesting, the, the sort of DevTools stuff that's going on. Um, Chrome have really gone down the line of all their performance tools. Uh, they've got some fantastic performance tools um, in Chrome. Firefox have taken a bit of a different approach. And they've really put a lot of resources into creating tools for designing with CSS, uh, which if you are working with you know, any of the things they've created a tool for, is really useful, especially things like grid. You, know, you can't see the grid areas um, easily. You can't add your own borders to them um, unless you've got an element in there. So being able to use sort of dev tools to inspect things is really useful. If you're using Firefox as a development browser, 
get yourself a copy of Firefox Nightly um, because all of the new work, and, and they're constantly working on these tools, all of the new stuff ends up in Nightly. So if you're using Firefox as a development browser, download the Nightly edition. Uh, I mean, I pretty much use Firefox Nightly all the time, and it's, you know, it's pretty stable. Uh, but it will get all the new stuff, new features of CSS, but also uh, the new dev tools. So for instance, we've got um, the grid layout tools, which they, they really have, I mean, Chrome's got a very, very basic grid layout tool, um, but it kind of just highlights the cells. Uh, the Firefox tool lets you really see the grid, lets you see where your items are aligned within the grid, um, and you can kind of play around, you can obviously change things um, in the CSS. It's really useful, the, the grid inspector there. So the things they've got, so they've got the grid tool, they've got a Flexbox tool, which may not be in the shipping version of the browser, it might just be in Nightly at the moment. Um, they've got a, a CSS shapes inspector, which shipped with their shapes implementation recently. Uh, so you can inspect basic shapes, and also if you are using like the polygon, um, you can adjust the polygon actually in the dev tools and then copy that out into your CSS. So it's quite a good way to mess around with your shapes. Uh, they've also got tools for variable fonts, um, which are shipping in all the browsers at the moment, to adjust the different axes of the fonts and play around with them and see how that works. Uh, so I really would recommend you have a look, if you haven't already, at the Firefox dev tools and get Nightly so you can play with all the latest stuff. Um, I think they, they're also very keen to hear feedback from people who are working with the tools as to what would be useful. Um, I found them very useful when teaching groups of designers new CSS to be able to say, right, you know, here's this, open it up in Firefox, let's actually have a look and a play around. Um, so it can, can be useful for sharing this stuff with other members of your team, um, you know, a more accessible way than them just looking at the CSS to play around actually with those dev tools. So what's coming up next? You know, what have we been um, discussing in the working group? What are we hoping to see in browsers really soon? So there's a whole load of stuff. There's always tons of different things being discussed. If you follow along on GitHub, you'll find that we're talking about all sorts of stuff. I've, I've picked out a couple of things that interest me. Um, one of those is this issue of aspect ratio on the web. Um, We've not really got a good way of dealing with aspect ratios. So if you've got something which has an aspect ratio, so an image, um, video, what have you, uh, we've been doing sort of things like using this padding hack to, to try and um, show aspect ratio, which works most of the time. But it would be nice just to have an aspect ratio unit. It would be nice just to be able to say, um, you know, I want this other dimension of this to, to retain the aspect ratio of, of the thing that I'm working with. Uh, we've got a very rough spec. We were talking about it at uh, the recent meeting for doing these aspect ratio units. Um, that link will take you to the draft spec, which also links to the issues on GitHub where we're discussing it. Lots and lots of people from the community are also discussing aspect ratio units. Um, if you have thoughts on that matter, or you think you might have thoughts on that matter, um, we'd be very interested. It's good to see as many use cases as possible. Uh, it turns out that developing new CSS is pretty much like developing the feature of any product. The more use cases you can see of how people might need to use that feature, the better you can make the feature. Uh, the thing with the web is once we've shipped something into browsers, we probably can't change it. So the more stuff we can get up front, the more information we can get from the community as to how things are being used, uh, the better we can make what ends up in browsers. Um, quite a lot of those discussions come down to what shall we call this thing? Um, I'm sure you're aware that many things in CSS are called very strange things, and that's because of history and the fact we can't really change stuff easily. So that's something that's, that's kind of coming up, isn't in any browsers yet, it's just in a rough state, but hopefully we'll see relatively soon. Now, I have a few little sort of pet things in CSS that I like to go on about. And I, I kind of think the more I talk about them, the more I might be able to make them kind of happen. Um, exclusions is one of them. Um, I'd really like to see some progress of this. Now, exclusions is implemented in IE 10 and up. But it's only Microsoft browsers that have an implementation of this. It didn't come from Microsoft. This came from Adobe. And it was part of the CSS shape spec. So shapes was shapes and exclusions, 
and then the, the spec was split and the shape spec carried on and exclusions kind of sat there, which I think is sad. Uh, I'll, sh I'll sort of show you why that I think it's a shame. So exclusions at one point was called positioned floats, which I think is quite descriptive of it because it allows you to sort of flow text around all sides of an element. So you know if you float something, it can either go left or right and the content then wraps around. Uh, with the exclusions, you could sort of pop something right in the middle of your document and have the text wrapping around both sides. Um, so it specifies this wrap flow property. As we say wrap flow both, you want the content to flow around both sides. The say is only implemented in Microsoft browsers with the MS prefix. So the demos I've got here and the things I've got online um, only work in Edge, or I guess in, in older IEs, although most of them use Grid, so you'd need to use Edge for them, um, but with the prefix. And so you get something like this. Um, here what I'm doing is I'm positioning the element with Grid Layout, um, sort of on top of the text, and then I use that wrap flow property, which says actually just flow the text around this thing, which is here. Now, this is useful in a number of use cases. It's kind of like a neat thing to be able to do, to stick my thing in the middle. Um, in sort of a lot of editorial design, that's exactly what you want. You want to be able to position items, and then you want to be able to flow text in, and you want the text just to respect the position of the item. You don't want to have to say, oh, well, this item has to be at the start of this paragraph so I can use float. So even if things are left or right aligned, often you don't actually know where they're going to come, but you want them to be in a certain point in the document. Uh, and I sort of wrote up this um, use case because I had someone send me uh, a problem they were having with Grid, and it was basically this. They were saying, well, I can't float an item anymore because if something's floated and then it becomes a Grid item, it stops being floated, it becomes a Grid item, uh, which is useful if you're trying to override a floated layout with Grid layout, but not if you actually do want a floated item. And I think it's that sort of thing that exclusions would solve. And so I, I sort of wrote it up and did some demos that that do work in Edge. And then we've got Houdini, because it might be that the layout method that you want is never going to be implemented by the CSS Working Group because it isn't kind of general enough. You've got something very specific that you want to be able to do in your very specific circumstance, but it doesn't matter how much you ask, it's not general enough. We're not going to be able to kind of implement that. And that's what Houdini really comes for. This is a project that aims to expose low-level APIs, making it possible for you to write your own extensions to CSS using JavaScript. And there's a few reasons to do that. Um, one would be to create really good polyfills for features that um, aren't implemented in all browsers. Another reason would be to experiment with things and then be able to propose them back to the CSS Working Group and say, hey, look, it would be great if we had this. I have built something that kind of works using Houdini, um, but it would be much better if it was kind of part of CSS and easier for other people. I mean, the other thing is to do those kind of custom things that are never going to become part of, uh, part of CSS. And because it's basically letting you get into those underlying APIs, it's going to be much more performant than the current way we do this sort of stuff with JavaScript. Now, Houdini is at a very early stage, but you can use it, at a lot of this stuff you can use in um, Chrome Canary uh, if you want to have a play around. You need to enable the experimental web platform features flags. So here's an example of a polyfill being used. So this is that conic gradient polyfill used with Houdini. Um, so this is an example that's online you can have a look at. So that, that would be an example of polyfilling something with Houdini. And these are from um, Vincent de Oliveira's site. So perhaps you want a gradient that doesn't exist at all, this corners gradient. You want this very specific gradient. Well, you could create that using Houdini. And a key use would be to create layouts in a more performant way. So if you're familiar with the masonry layout method, where you can sort of it's not quite grid, it's not quite flexbox. You've basically got boxes that kind of push up into um, so to, to make room for, for the different boxes. You can do that with JavaScript. It doesn't perform very well at scale. Um, this is a really good use case for something like Houdini. Um, it may be at some point that we do specify something like this at the CSS Working Group. I know there's a lot of people who would like to have an inbuilt CSS masonry, 
but it's the sort of thing that Houdini would also let you do to, um, to create your own sort of masonry or whatever layout type that you want. I don't have time to go dive into this today, but um, this site, um, Sam Richards created this site, um, houdini.glitch.me, which is a kind of interactive uh, introduction to the different APIs. So you can play around with some of the things that work um, if you use Chrome with, with the flags enabled. And Surma has created this chart, is Houdini ready yet? Which kind of details the different um, APIs. So we've got the layout API, paint, uh, the parser and properties and values, all these different APIs that are going to be used um, for Houdini, and you can see the status of them and sort of where they're getting to. Um, so that's something that is, that is happening. It's something that at every CSS Working Group meeting, there's some time put aside to discuss Houdini and to move it forward. It's obviously complex because every browser is different. Um, so to actually expose those APIs is different for every browser. But it's something we're getting to, and I think it's quite exciting. If you are someone who can write JavaScript polyfills at the moment, um, or is able to kind of you know, do layout stuff, looking into Houdini, uh, I think is going to be very exciting over the next couple of years. And so I've been showing you a bunch of cool stuff, and I know from experience there will be some of you wondering why anyone is expending brain energy looking at things that aren't in browsers yet, um, and you probably won't be able to use for at least a decade. Um, but things are improving in, in that way. Um, things are moving an awful lot more quickly into browsers. We're seeing things implemented at a much faster rate. And we've also got things built into CSS to help us do this. Um, now, CSS itself is great at progressive enhancement. If a browser comes across any bit of CSS that it doesn't understand, it just goes, I don't know what this is, and ignores it completely. It doesn't do anything weird, it just ignores it, which means that you can use new stuff in your browser, um, and as long as it just sort of fails silently, that's fine. So something like CSS shapes, you could just use it, and if you don't get the shape, that's probably OK. Um, you can use things as enhancement. The problem comes where you've, got, you've done some old stuff, and then you want to do some new stuff, but something in the new stuff would kind of leak through to the old layout. You know, for instance, if you have you know, you're building a float layout, you're going to enhance it with grid. The float will be ignored by grid, but the width you've applied to the items to make your floated layout work will be interpreted by the grid layout and will make things smaller than you want them. So you kind of want to be able to fork your code. Um, so we've got feature queries in CSS which let you detect support and do things when you know you've got support. Um, they look a bit like a media query, except we're using at supports rather than at media. And what you do is you test for property and value. So here I'm saying um, at supports, and then I've used background conic gradient. So I'm looking to see if the browser has a conic gradient support. If it does have conic gradient support, then I'm going to use it. But if it doesn't, what I've done first is I've used a linear gradient. So that means if you don't have support, you'll get the linear gradient. If you do have support, you should get the conic gradient. So you get something like this. Um, so you you know, in, in Firefox, whatever, you would get the linear gradient. So feature queries are incredibly useful to help us kind of progressively enhance our CSS in a sort of, sort of sensible way, in a way that allows us to, to not worry too much about using the new things. We're not going to cause sort of bad things to happen in, in the old browser. So particularly useful when using older layout lay methods like floats and then overriding them. Um, Typically, I have a stack of um, selectors which where I'm just knocking off the width and the margins that I've used to make my older layout work once I'm in grid. And the other reason to start using this new stuff, as well as the fact it's cool and you can enhance your layouts and do all sorts of interesting things that uh, become little enhancements, the other reason to start using the new stuff is that you get to kind of influence the process to some extent um, because you can talk to us. As I mentioned, everything's happening in the open. We really, really appreciate the CSS Working Group getting feedback from people who are using CSS. Um, so by using some of this stuff, particularly when it's at a really early stage, that's the chance to change it. If something is behind a flag in a browser um, and you can look at it and you can say, hey, hang on, that doesn't work very well. I've got, got a better idea. I can see a problem. At that point, we can probably change it. Once it's shipped in two browsers, we probably can't change it. 
uh, because it's out there, people are using it for their projects. Uh, so it is worth kind of finding out what's hidden behind flags and playing around with it, because then you can help influence that process. Very, very few people do. The few people who actually get engaged in the process have, you know, quite an awful lot of influence in terms of the way things go because so people do get involved with early stage specs. So that's one way to influence the future of CSS is to find out what's coming and talk to us about it. That'd be great. The other thing is start telling browsers what you want. And you can do that in a whole bunch of ways. Um, you can raise issues with browsers. As, you know, the bug trackers are online. You can go and say, hey, I want you to implement this or you've implemented this and it's broken or you've implemented this and it's now different in the spec to what you did. You can add new use cases to issues. Um, that's often very helpful and it shows as well that there's interest. Writing and talking about this stuff. You know, I keep talking about exclusions because I would like to see progress and, you know, actually telling more people about it hopefully will help with that. But also use the features. The all of the browsers are inspecting what people are using. No browser wants to be the only browser that has not implemented something that everyone else is using because it makes their browser look broken. So if you're using the stuff, that is going to be noted. So even if you can only use it on a personal site, that helps to kind of build the amount of sites that are using that particular feature, makes it more likely it will end up in the browser that, that isn't currently supporting it. So thank you very much for listening to this rundown. As I say, everything is online. And I'm happy to take a few questions if I've got time, or you can sort of track me down later. Thank you very much.